All right, if you have a Bible, let's go ahead and grab it. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 6 this morning. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians is one of Paul's 13 letters that he wrote in the New Testament. You can find Ephesians in the New Testament, um, and it's an amazing letter. We're going to learn a lot about what Paul writes in chapter 6, particularly those first four verses um, as it pertains to the subject of navigating parenthood and what we're going to be talking about this morning on how we're to invest in the next generation um, that comes after us. But before we get there, I want to again read from Psalm 127, verses 3 through 5. We read it last week, but I want to read it every week as we dive into this series because it serves as the framework for us to build on. And my hope and my prayer is that we will understand the importance of this subject matter, that you, mom and dad, have an incredible role. Uh, when it comes to raising your kids. And again, just to clarify this, as we did, did last week, if you don't have children or if you're an empty nester and your kids have already flown the coop, so to speak, please don't tune out from this series. You, you have a role to play uh, as well. This is not just for people who have biological children. If you have children, if you're part of this church, the answer is, is yes for you. If you have children that you have a realm of influence over, This is for you. I talked last week how I just love the uh, senior adults in this church who show up on Wednesday nights to invest in our kids' ministry and student ministry, and they don't have any skin in the game because their kids have already grown into adults uh, and they're empty nesters. And they can be home on a Wednesday night just on the recliner, you know, watching Netflix or something, Um, but they've chosen to be here on a Wednesday night because they understand the importance of investing in the next generation. So uh, Psalm 127, beginning in verse 3, here's how it reads. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruits of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. What I love about Psalm 127, particularly in that passage, is you may have noticed that the psalmist sandwiches a really important verse between two themes um, about children being a reward and how the person who has his quiver full of children is, is blessed. But that truth, that reality is sandwiched by a very important verse I want to read again. Verse 4. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Last week we talked about how important it is for the direction of the arrow to fly. And the direction of the arrow, the the, the target, its intended destination, is largely determined by who? The warrior, the archer, a.k.a. the parents. So not just in Psalm 127, but thematically all throughout the scripture, arrows equal children, warrior slash the archer equals parents. And so there comes a, a moment in the life of our family, mom and dad, where we set the kids to the bow, And we extend back and we release it. We release our kids into the world. How do we ensure that when our children are released into the world, they'll be able to combat the environment around them? The different winds of culture, the winds of the enemy that that is attempting with with every ounce of their strength to to throw them off course. How how can we set our kids up in such a way that when we, we, excuse me, When we release them into the world, it would be a successful release. Well, that's what I want to focus on this morning. I want to look at how important it is to ensure that the arrows we have in our quiver are crafted and designed in such a way that they will be able to pierce straight through the winds of the lies of this world to reach their intended targets. And let me make it absolutely clear. The target is always faith in Jesus Christ. That's the target. It's not worldly success. It's not worldly fame. It's not worldly goals or accomplishments. Those things are fantastic and praiseworthy, mind you. And we'll spend a portion of this sermon series talking about the role of mom and dad in providing physically for their children. That's important. But what's of greater importance is releasing our children into a world to succeed spiritually. And the way that we do that is by aiming their hearts towards a target. And that target is always faith in Jesus Christ. Christ. 
Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14, if you want to write this down. Here's what Paul writes. Paul says, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in, guess who? Jesus Christ. Not in the things of this world, but in Jesus Christ. So what does Paul recognize? He recognizes two things. One, that there is a prize that we are to strive for. Secondly, that prize is not in the things of this world. That prize is in a person, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. So parents, we have the incredible responsibility to shape, mold, and form our children in such a way that they are released and aimed towards the target of Jesus Christ. And so I want to talk about what it looks like for parents to intentionally aim the hearts of their children towards the Lord. And so I've titled the message this morning, Discipleship in the Home. If you've been to church long enough, you've probably heard that word thrown around at some point. The phrase, discipleship. Now, discipleship is rooted in what word? Disciple. It's rooted in the word, disciple. And the best way that I can explain what a disciple is, is this way. A disciple is someone who has been and someone who is being. Well, Roland, what do you mean by that? Here's what I mean. A disciple has been adopted, has been adopted by God into his family and is being formed by God into Christ's likeness. And I want us to catch this. So a disciple has been adopted into God's family. And once we've been adopted into God's family, we are then being formed into Christ's likeness. How do we know this? Romans 8, 29. Here's what it says. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. In other words, those who have been adopted into God's family have now been put on a path... You've been purposed. There has been a plan written for your life that doesn't end whenever you place faith in Jesus Christ, but continues into the rest of your life. And what is the story of the rest of your life? Paul says it there in Romans 8, 29. To be conformed to the image of his son. This is what discipleship is all about. This is what being a disciple is all about. About. So let's contextualize that in the role of parents, in the role of the home and mom and dad. You have been given the arrow, your child. And now you are tasked with the responsibility to mold and shape them into Christ's likeness. Making disciples, as a matter of fact, was the final command Jesus gave his church before he ascended back into the kingdom of heaven. Do you remember the words Jesus gave? He says to go and what? Make disciples. He was imparting some final instructions and some final wisdom. And we learned about how important final words are last week when we studied Deuteronomy chapter 6. Jesus is giving some final words. He's imparting final wisdom to his family, to his people, to his disciples before he ascends back to the throne. And he leaves them with this. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So you need to go and make disciples. You need to teach them everything that is in the scriptures. You need to baptize them in the name of the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, knowing this truth. I'm going to be with you always until the end of this age. What age was Jesus talking about? This current age. Because there will come a day in which the Lord will return and who will receive him? His people, those who have been conformed into his image. And so making disciples is how the kingdom of God continues from generation to generation. Now, mom and dad, parents, here's, here's the truth. Here's the challenge. Not only must we embrace this truth in our own lives... But more importantly, we must instruct this truth and teach our kids to do the same. So when it comes to crafting that arrow, when it comes to setting that arrow up, a.k.a. our children, in such a way that when we release them into the world, they are set up to spiritually succeed the best way that we can. How do we do that? How do we effectively disciple our kids? 
How do we effectively take our kids to understand what it means to be adopted into God's family and what it means to be formed into the image of the Son, Jesus Christ? Four applications I want to look at this morning as we draw our attention to the passage in Ephesians. And I believe that as we apply these four truths to our lives, it will set us up to succeed, mom and dad, in leading our family into a greater, deeper, and more personal pursuit of Jesus Christ. Now, let me tell you why that's important. We mentioned this last week, and we're going to continue to repeat this theme throughout this series. If we are not being intentional with aiming the hearts of our kids towards Jesus Christ, make no mistake, someone else is going to do the job for us. And oftentimes than not, that someone else is the world and the culture. And the Jesus and the truth that the world and the culture teaches this generation of kids, make no mistake, is not the Jesus and the truth of the scripture. It's a distortion, it's a twisting of God's divine standard and God's divine and holy truth. So the greatest responsibility you and I have, mom and dad, that responsibility is to teach our children the word of God. We'll dive into that here in just a moment. You, mom and dad, are the primary influence when it comes to faith. You cannot contract that responsibility to someone else. And I've seen this often in in my experience and in, in my time in ministry. Oftentimes... Mom and dad mean well. They want their children to genuinely know the Lord. They want their children to genuinely have faith in Jesus. But I think often where we fall short, parents, is we will contract that responsibility to the church. It's the church's job to raise my kids in faith. Now let me hit the pause button there because I need to clarify. It's not the church's primary responsibility to raise your children. Rather, it's the church's responsibility to first give honor and glory to God. Secondly, when it comes to parenting and discipleship in the home, to assist and supplement the already truth you should be proclaiming in the home. That's the role of the church. The church is never a substitute for mom and dad. But often we can make the mistake of thinking that church is the substitute for what mom and dad should be doing in the home. We'll dive into that topic here in just a moment. But four applications that we can draw from Ephesians um, that will allow us to lead and succeed in guiding our family to greater and deeper truths in Jesus. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. Let's look at verses 1 through 4. Here's how it reads. Children, obey your parents. And mom and dad said, amen. Children, obey your parents in who? In the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is an echo of Exodus 20. This is the first commandment with the promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Verse 4, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And all God's people said... Amen. Lord, bless your word and stir our hearts. So Paul, as he's writing this letter, in Ephesians chapter 6, he immediately begins to talk about what discipleship in the home looks like. But here's what I love about how Paul sets this up. Throughout this entire letter, he's focusing on two themes. The first theme is proper theology. The second theme is proper conduct. In other words, Paul is establishing, here are some baseline beliefs that you should live your life according to. And when these beliefs are baseline, at a minimum, in your life, then proper conduct will follow. In other words, your behavior should be informed by your beliefs. Your orthopraxy should be defined by your orthodoxy, right? Let's throw some fancy words on there. Your beliefs should inform your behaviors. And so Paul is setting up this structure that when the home has proper theology, then the home can begin to properly disciple their family. And so this passage, it really embodies what discipleship in the home looks like. And so by the time we get to Ephesians chapter 6, Paul, in his letter, has already laid out what a foundation 
of godly theology looks like, what this foundation and framework looks like, so that when the framework of the family is set, then what comes in Ephesians 5 and Ephesians 6 can be done best. So here's the thing, though. I need you to watch this, Mom and Dad. You cannot disciple your children if you are not a disciple yourself. Let me, re- l- let me say that again. You can't disciple your children if you are not a disciple yourself. This goes back to contracting out the raising of our kids to the church. Or let me put it another way. You cannot place expectations on your children that you are not willing to fulfill yourself. Anybody ever been there? You can talk the talk, but can you walk the walk? It goes back to this whole idea of don't do as I say, but rather do as I do. And oftentimes, and I've seen this in the home, I'm guilty of this as well. And mind you, let me just, let me just say, I am not perfect in any of this. I shared with you last week, everything that I preach, I preach out of conviction and accountability. So by the time that you hear it from the pulpit, God has already been convicting me. I've already repented. And God has been stirring this theme in my heart for weeks, if not months, before sharing it with, with the church. But I think we can all relate with this, that, that oftentimes... We will expect things of our kids that we ourselves are not willing to fulfill. And discipleship does not work that way. Jesus, when he called his disciples, he used three simple words and they were life-changing words. Come, follow me. That's what discipleship is. Is following after the Lord. Now, in the context of the family, it's your children, mom and dad, following after you. Which is why Paul will often say things like this in the New Testament. Follow me as I follow Christ. That same statement rings true for parents. Children, follow us as we follow Christ. So you can't place expectations on your children that you are not willing to fulfill yourself. And I think... This is why Paul explains the outworking of the gospel in the home. How does he do that? By first making a very powerful statement. And I want us to to watch this very carefully. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Let's look at verse 1. One entire chapter before he even gets to the role of children in the home. Here's what he says in verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God... As beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Now, in the context of the entire New Testament, this is a call and a command to God's people, to everyone, parents or not. This is a call and a command. You are to imitate the Father as a child imitates their earthly parents. But here's what's neat because what follows. After verse 1, is Paul now dissecting the family unit? And as Paul begins to establish structures and roles within the family between husband, wife, mom, dad, and children, what does he first focus on? He first focuses on proper theology so that proper theology can then result in proper conduct. And then what does he say in verse 1? Be imitators of God as beloved children. Did you catch that? A disciple is like a child who imitates the Lord. And mom and dad, this is where being a disciple begins. It begins with the Lord. And before you lay these expectations on your children, you need to be modeling first in your home. Now, now let me hit the pause button here uh, and really challenge us with something. Parents, we can get caught in the trap of lowering the bar for our kids. Let me kind of flesh that out. Have you ever been in a scenario, mom and dad, with your children, particularly your teenage children, where you kind of excuse behavior with, with, with this reasoning? Well, man, they're a teenager. I did the same thing when I was a kid. Now, mind you, it's one thing to extend grace and mercy and to understand, ah, man, teenagers, they just don't get it sometimes, and they fall victim to temptation. I did just as well. But you know what? God's a gracious God, and he pulls us out of that. Now, it's one thing to extend grace and 
be motivated by that. It's something else entirely to lower the bar and excuse behavior. Now, again, mind you, when we talk about parenting and discipling, we're not talking about modifying behavior, though that is part of it, but rather the root of, the root of modified behavior is a heart that's sold out for Christ. Because you can behave like an A-plus student who minds their manners, makes their bed every morning, eats your peas and carrots, but your heart can still be far from the Lord. Jesus dealt personally with religious people like that throughout his life in ministry. And he would say things like what? Your whitewashed tombs. In other words, you look pretty and put together on the outside, but deep down that heart is rotten and corrupt. It's dead. There's no life in it. So I'm not talking about modified behavior. I'm talking about pointing the hearts of our kids towards the gospel. Because when we seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, everything else will be added to us. So remember, parents, it starts with you. Don't lower the bar. Don't lower expectations. Don't excuse the behavior of your children with this idea, well, they're teenagers. I did the same thing at my age. Everyone look at me. It is perfectly okay to set higher standards and expectations for your children. It is absolutely okay to raise the bar for your family and say, you know what? I made mistakes when I was a kid, but I'm going to set the standard and raise the bar so my kids don't follow in that same pattern. Don't follow in that same direction. So how do we do that, parents? How do we get to a spot where we understand it starts with you? Let's go back to our passage and look at these four applications. Here's the first one. We must create or we create the best environment for our children to grow as disciples when we champion our marriage. That's the beautiful thing here. Now, mind you. While Paul specifically focuses on the marriage between one man and one woman, marriage vows that have been committed to one another for life, I, I do want to clarify and stress this. We have people that come from divorced homes, marriages that have been on the rocks. We, we, we have people who are in single family homes. And I want you to know God redeems all sorts of people. And God redeems all sorts of marriages. Now, we're focusing on this specific marriage because that's what the text addresses. But I want you to know that don't feel like you're not included in this because maybe your marriage doesn't quite represent what Paul is stressing here in Ephesians 5 and Ephesians 6. God redeems all things and works all things for the glory of his name and the good of his kingdom. And so keep that in mind. Receive that. Be transformed by that. But in regards to our passage... A strong marriage is a firm marriage. And I often like to phrase it this way. Strong families make, or excuse me, strong marriages, I clued you in already. Strong marriages lead to strong what? Families. So a strong marriage is a firm marriage. Do you know what a firm marriage does? A firm marriage creates security in the home. And it models a firm foundation to your children. And it doesn't just model an earthly security or an earthly foundation, but it paints a bigger picture of a spiritual security and a spiritual foundation. Outside of the church, do you know what relationship best models and is a, uh, a great picture of the relationship Christ has with the church? The marriage relationship. Which is why Paul stresses the importance of the roles and the structure of marriage. And so we create the best environment when we champion our marriage. When we're in it together. And so championing your marriage means you are embracing your roles in marriage. And so mom and dad, husband and wife, if we want to create the best environment for our kids to grow as disciples of Jesus Christ, then it begins with a marriage that honors the Lord so that it then honors one another. Now, how do we know this? Because Paul is giving instructions for the household before he ever begins to mention children. You ever picked up on that pattern in Ephesians? He first focuses on the marriage, and when he focuses on the marriage, he then begins to focus on the overflow of a marriage that focuses on the Lord. So I need you guys to buckle up, because it's about to get uncomfortable here for a minute. Let's go back to Ephesians chapter 5. I want us to read beginning in verse 22. Now remember, we're talking about an environment that establishes and raises our kids for their hearts to be aimed at Jesus. How do we do that? By championing our marriage. What does it mean to champion our marriage? 
It means by living and walking in our marriage in accordance with our roles. Here's where it gets uncomfortable. Some of you know where I'm going with this. Beginning in verse 22, Ephesians 5. Wives. Do you want me to say it? Submit to your own husbands. Now, husbands, before you get pigeon-chested here, all right, you need to buckle up too. Because what is the framework here? Wives, submit to your husbands, but what's the framework? Four simple words. As to the Lord. That's the framework for submission. What has happened in our culture is, it is this has been twisted. By men who have craved power. By men who have made their wives feel inferior. Made them feel little. Who have robbed them of character and independence. And so it, it's, it, it's no mystery how in Western and American culture... We read things like this, and it creates tension. Submit. Because if we're honest, submission in Western culture has not been painted in a good light. Amen? It is not. Men, we have failed in our role of leading our wives the way Christ leads his church. We're going to talk about this in just a moment. Which is the reason why women don't feel safe, or wives don't feel safe in submitting to their husbands. So wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife... Even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and is himself, it's what? Savior. So what's the framework of submission? The Lord. What's the framework of the husband leading his wife and his family? The Lord. Are are we sensing a common theme here? What does it boil down to? The Lord. Verse 24. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Verse 25, here's the challenge, men. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. This is the filter, men, that we need to look through when it comes to marriage. Every word that we utter, every action and decision that we make needs to be viewed through this lens. Am I setting my wife up and my family up to love the Lord? Am I loving my wife as Christ loved the church? Because what did Christ do to the church? He gave himself up for her. This is where it becomes paradoxical and ironic. Because verse 22 says, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. And if we get pigeon chested here, and if we view this through the lens of culture, then what do we see? How do we we define this? If we're not careful, we see it and we define it through this lens. My wife is here to serve me. My needs and my wants. Whew. That's a false way of looking at it. Because what did Christ do for the church? Lay down his life. What did Christ tell his disciples? The Lord came not to be served, but to serve. Ooh. You see the irony there? How it kind of gets paradoxical? So the one who should do the serving is what? The husband. Which is why the scripture says... We are to outdo one another in serving. Like it should be this fun game about how we're to outdo one another in the service that we bring to our families. So the concept of submission should come from that. Here's where it is. The concept of submission, the concept of leading should come from that which exists between Christ Jesus and his church. Does Christ ever... Thumb our back to the church? Does, does Christ ever make the church feel inferior? Does Christ ever make the church feel less than? Does, the, does, does Christ ever lead in such a way where the church feels robbed of its identity? No, 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 no. It's quite opposite, isn't it? Christ leads and loves in such a way where we discover our identity. He leads and loves in such a way where we discover security. And all the foundation we will ever need to build a life that honors him and glorifies him. So why is there such stress on the role of husband and wife in Ephesians, really throughout the scripture? Because the fall, back in Genesis 3, what were the consequences of the fall? One of the consequences of the fall was that women would be in competition or would combat the leadership role of their husband. 
And so there would be this leadership collision in the home, right? That was one of the consequences. Another one of the consequences was that everything the man was to steward and lead would fight back against him. So what Paul instructs us about in Ephesians chapter 5, get this, it brings redemption to the marriage relationship. In the context of husband and wife, those consequences of leadership collisions in the home are now redeemed when the husband loves his wife the way Christ loves the church and when the wife submits to her husband as to the Lord. It's all about the framework of what? The gospel. And so when the marriage is championed, mom and dad, when it's prioritized, it creates a foundation and a security for your children. And that foundation and security, guess what? Is a shadow of a greater foundation and a greater security. Eternal life in Jesus Christ. Now notice... I did not say champion a perfect marriage. Anyone have a perfect marriage in here? No. We can all say amen to that. But what does it do? It demonstrates to our children that though we fail and fall short in some areas, though mom and dad have disagreements, though mom and dad are going to slam doors in each other's faces sometimes and voices are going to be raised, though that's a reality of what happens in the marriage relationship, children can discover and know that despite all the shortcomings that is our humanity, there can exist a unity when we are, as Paul declares in Ephesians, reaching ahead, striving forward for the prize, the goal of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And so let's champion our marriage so that our kids understand that in our weaknesses and imperfections, that's where the might, the glory, the redemption, and the strength of Christ is shown. So we create the best environment for our children to grow as disciples when we champion our marriage. The second application is this. We create the best environment for our children to grow as disciples when we lead with trust and obedience. And this is where I think it's really neat. Because right in the middle of addressing the role of husband and wife, what does Paul do beginning, beginning in Ephesians chapter 6? He sort of hits the pause button in order to address children. Almost as if he is saying, hey, kids in the audience, you're not left out. I haven't forgotten about you. You have a role to play in this as well. Well, what is that role? Did you notice the progression? It's all about obedience and honoring your mother and father. And here's what's really cool, right? I, I really want to focus on this because I think it's important. Kids in the room, I, I, need you, I need you to listen up and look at me. Did you know Paul includes disobedience to parents? I love this. I think this is incredible. He includes disobedience to parents in the same grouping as he includes liars, gossipers, and murderers. You know, it's very easy in our culture to kind of level out sins. And we'll say, okay, this sin, like that's a level one sin. That's like a felony type sin. This sin, well, you know, it, it, it's kind of okay. Now, mind you, albeit consequences are different depending on the sin. We can admit that. However, when it comes to separation from God, when it comes to interfering with spiritual growth and discipleship, all sins, regardless of its disobedience to parents or these other ones that Paul groups together, all of them interfere with what the craving of the soul is. And that is something more, something greater. So I love the progression. When husband and wife are fulfilling their God-given roles, and what's the framework for husband and wife fulfilling their God-given roles? It's the Lord Jesus, as in the Lord. That's important to understand because it will fail if it's not. So when husband and wife are fulfilling their God-given roles, then the natural progression of obedience begins to extend to the rest of the family. So let's go back and let's read those first three verses. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. So the framework doesn't stop. The framework of obedience and fulfilling your roles doesn't stop. It extends into the life of the children. For this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. We need to address the roots of obedience. So obedience for children is in the Lord. 
So in order for that first part, obey your parents, let's call that horizontal obedience, in order for that to be a reality, it first needs to be from the overflow, the result of, let's call it vertical obedience. Are you following me? So when children are in the Lord, when they're being instructed by their parents and their hearts being aimed towards faith in Jesus Christ, that vertical obedience then overflows into horizontal obedience. And this is what we are called to model and lead with. We are called to model and lead with trust and obedience. And then Paul begins to follow it up with this phrase, this is right. Well, what does he mean by that? Does he mean that, that this is simply fact in that, in, in that term? Does it mean this is simply truth in that term? Or could there be something more that Paul is demonstrating with that phrase, this is right? So when Paul says this is right, what he's referring to is this is righteous. This is just. This is the way of life. The implications is that parental instruction should be in line with the will of God. How we lead and how we guide kids. Why? Because children are dependent on their parents. And that relationship of trust begins to develop over the course of their life. And here's what's amazing. The trust that children have in their parents is a beautiful picture of the trust the church has in Jesus Christ. Which is why, again, going back to Ephesians chapter 5, Paul makes it absolutely, absolutely clear that if you are a follower of Jesus, remember, how did he begin verse 1 in uh, chapter 5? He said, therefore. Well, what does that mean? That word therefore means as a result of, because of. Everything that he has taught from chapter 1 to chapter 4 should lead to this reality in our life. And what is Paul doing in the first four chapters? He is instructing us in proper theology. Here's how you're to view God. Here's how you're to worship God. Here's how you're to trust and walk in obedience to God. Therefore, as a result of proper theology, imitate the Father, just like a child does. For this is right. Paul's instruction is delivered in this context. Watch this, mom and dad. Under the assumption that parents will love and guard their children... And that kids will obey them until they are old enough to live on their own. Remember, as much as we want to, mom and dad, we cannot make that decision for our kids. There's going to come a moment when they will be responsible for their own faith decision. And as much as we would like to make that decision for them, as much as we wish that our kids could have eternal life based on what our decision is, it doesn't work that way. They are personally held responsible for their own decisions. The best we can do is trust that I'm going to shape them and mold them in such a way that when they are released into independent living, their hearts are aimed at Jesus Christ. And I will do everything in my power to ensure that the truth that they believe is the truth of Scripture so that they can combat the lies of this world, the lies that would attempt to rob them of any sort of future and hope. Parents, isn't that a battle worth fighting for? I pray that you go to your knees in prayer for your children. It's an amazing and beautiful thing. And so Paul finishes... That passage by saying, honor your father and mother that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Now, this, this was a promise given to the Israelites back in Exodus chapter 20. What land were they about to inherit? The promised land, the land of Canaan. So in the context of Israel, God was making a physical promise to them that it may go well with you in the land. And what else? That you may live long. Now, in their context, they received physical blessings. Those physical blessings provided the resources to them and for them to continue to advance the kingdom forward, which is why we read about throughout the Chronicles, the Kings, and in the books of Samuel about the Davidic dynasty, the reach of King David, and how he was a man after God's own heart. It's an incredible story in the Old Testament. But what does that look like for us today? Because that promise remains true. How do we know? Paul emphasizes it here in chapter 6. What does it look like for your children to be living out that truth that it may go well for you? 
It's not going to look like physical blessings. Does that come? Sure. And praise the Lord for that. But ultimately, what is he getting at? He's getting to the meat of discipleship. That it's about the Lord. It's about trusting in him and turning to him. Sometimes if we are not careful, we can make what is very simple quite confusing. Now we know that discipleship is not a simple task, but it's not a confusing one either. It's about pointing the hearts of our children towards Jesus. How do we do that? Right? This is what we're here for, right? How do we form and craft that arrow, mom and dad? This is where Paul gets to the meat, which leads to our third application. Paul says, do not provoke your children. More specifically, who does he address there in verse 4? Fathers. Now, why do you think Paul is addressing fathers? Now, mind you, mothers, you are not um, spared from this. But more importantly, why why is he addressing fathers? Because fathers have an incredible role of leadership in the home. And we shut this statistic. When a father is spiritually leading the home, I'm not talking about being present as the mother leads the home, but when the father is spiritually leading the home, did you know the odds are in favor of your children living a life that honors and glorifies the Lord? Statistics, the data just shows us upwards of 85 to 95% of the time your children are going to grow into adults that honor and love the Lord. Does that mean they're going to be perfect? No, but they're going to be they're going to be living and building their life on an established and firm foundation. So fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. This is a twofold command and then and then we have one more application and then we'll be done. Here's a twofold command. Number 1, Paul is is displaying or demonstrating and sharing this truth in the face of Greco-Roman culture. This is the culture they lived in. The culture that they lived in, the father was very harsh at home. Right? If anyone's ever seen the movie 300, right? it, 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 it's kind of an um, outside-of-the-facts depiction of kind of what that culture was like, but what they got right was, was how harsh they treated the boys at home. Right? Man, if you didn't make it, if you didn't man up, if you didn't pull up your boots, like, boom, you're out. Now, mind you, so I have a prayer card for, for, for my son, Liam. And, and on my prayer card, if you were here on, on our Wednesday night adult midweek Bible study, I shared with you that in quotations, I have the phrase, man up. It's in our home. That's a phrase that we've been using a lot. You've got to man up. You've got to pull your boots up. Let's go. Let's get after it. There's a battle that's laid before us. We've got to gear up for the show. And it's not in a way where you belittle, where you put down, and you rob our, your children of their character fathers. But it's in such a way where you lift them up to know that greater is he who is in us, right, than he who is in the world sort of concept. Where we are preparing our children to face the battle ahead. So this flies in the face of Greco-Roman culture, where the men were very hard, had the thumb on their back of their children. And so just as fathers are called to shepherd love and lead their wife the way Christ shepherds loves and leads the church, that extends down to fathers not provoking their children. And so I also want to challenge you with this truth, because here's the second thing. It's not just provoking your children through the things that you commit, Dad, right? Dads, do you ever remember holding the flashlight for for your father, right? Like, that's a discipleship moment, right? You not know how to hold a flashlight, right? We're getting PTSD there, some flashbacks. But, But we get the idea, right? Not provoking your children just doesn't extend to the things that you commit, but... What if Paul is also talking about not just raising your children with a heavy hand, but but also being an absent dad? Because provoking your children to anger isn't just about the things that you do, it's about the things that you omit. And so I would bargain to say there is more hurt in a child who has had an absent father as opposed to a child who had a father who provoked them by putting the thumb on their back. So, Dad, you have a huge responsibility and a huge role in raising your kids. The fourth and final one is this. Let's discipline and instruct our children. Verse 4 comes to a close with this beautiful and powerful statement. Bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Here's what's really cool, and I'll, I'll close on this. That word, bring them up, is the same word that Paul uses in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 29, when Paul says this. No one ever hated his own body, 
but nourishes and cherishes it. So that phrase, bring them up, and that phrase, nourish, is the same word in the Greek. In other words, this picture that Paul is painting and how we're to discipline and instruct our children is through proper nourishment. Now, you think he's talking about a a, a five-course meal or eating your Wheaties for breakfast? No, he's talking about spiritual nourishment. If there's any nourishment that we really need to press into, it's spiritual nourishment. Nourishment. So the focus is on the fact that, and all that a father does to bring his children to maturity, there should be this provision above all to point their hearts towards the love and the mercy of Jesus Christ. The way that we spiritually nourish our children, Paul then continues, is through what? Discipline and instruction. Now, why is discipline and instruction important? Let me tell you why. Because in Acts chapter 20, do you know what we're told? Let me just read it to you. It's, it's, it's amazing. Paul warns us but with these words. He says, be on guard because there will come savage wolves that will rise against God's flock and there will be some who will distort the truth in order to draw some away. Are we not seeing that in the world today, mom and dad? Which is why it's so vital that we discipline and instruct them with the word of God. Later in the Bible, the scripture says this, that in these last days, there will be men of lawlessness. What does that mean? That means there will be people who will combat the truth. There will be people who, in the face of God's standards, will continually embrace the lies of the world. But when we are instructing our children in gospel truth, we set them up to face a lawless world, prepared to combat all that has come against them. Things like marriage, things like gender identity, things like sexuality, things like the right to life. Like all these issues that are told that we can embrace according to our feelings and our truth in this world. God's truth says this is how we should fight against that. This is how we should combat that. This is how we should come and love and minister to other people. And if we are not disciplining and instructing our kids in that, then guess what? The devil takes his arrow and begins to do this. Ooh, what happens? That happens. Is that going to fly very far? It might go somewhere, but it's not going to go to its intended target. And so we need to do everything that we can, mom and dad. So I want to leave you with this challenge. Let's be intentional in our roles as parents. Let's embrace the call to discipleship in the home. And let me leave you with this Bible verse. It is so encouraging. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And here it is. I want you to catch this. Knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Keep fighting the good fight. You keep praying for that wayward child. Don't you dare give up on the Lord. Your work is not in vain, mom and dad. With every ounce of your strength, you do what you need to do to aim the hearts of your children towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't you dare give up. They are worth fighting for. And the Lord promises that it will not be in vain. Let me pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you how it brings life change and transformation. Lord, I pray that you would begin to empower us, strengthen us, and guide us. Lord, that in all things, you would be glorified. In Christ's name we pray. All God's people said, amen. Would you stand to your feet with me? We're going to close our service through a time of worship and song. Let's sing these words to the Lord. Let, let, let them mean something. And we're going to have a time of response. In other words, our altar is going to be open. If the Lord is leading you to receive prayer, to repent of sin, um, to come forward and talk about what salvation is, what faith in Christ means, Pastor Eric and myself will be available. Um, We'd love to pray with you. I love you, church.